This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. Some 5,000 years ago, a group of people in what is now southeastern Iraq made a tower out of mud brick, thinking it would turn into a portal between them and the spirit realm. Today, uh, Babel is a little more high tech. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Thank you for joining us. This is uh, uh, a new location here inside the barn, which is our new, uh, I, I guess we're the semi-official name for our new studio here, which we have uh, uh, only been able to do through your generosity. It is our 30 by 40 foot pole barn that has been reconfigured, redone, cleaned up, insulated, heated, cooled, and uh, lighted, as you can see. Um, sitting in front of a green screen, what you're seeing behind me um, it's not really how this looks, but uh, anyway, it seemed to fit the uh, the title and uh, the place. Uh, joined tonight by our new rescue dog, Grace, who is a flat-coated retriever. She's uh, down here at my feet. Uh, seems to be happy enough to be out here uh, when before she'd always been really bored, so... Well, <laughs> this may become a, a regular thing. Anyway, uh, we appreciate you joining us. Please uh, take a moment if you're subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, share that link, click the bell for notifications, and then uh, please download our app. Our free app gets all of our content directly into your smartphone or tablet. Guarantees we will never be canceled because they keep moving the goalposts on what uh, constitutes the uh, uh, the rules for uh, community guidelines. So uh, you'll find that at vftb.net or gilberthouse.org slash app. Gilberthouse.org, sort of our web hub for everything that we do. Joining us tonight, uh, and actually this is kind of a, a two for one uh, today as far as uh, spending time with uh, this gentleman, uh, is a, uh, a fellow who to this point has been writing um, fantasy series for young and middle school readers with plots that he helped uh W was helped to develop with his two children. They got bored with the bedtime stories that he was reading to them, and so they started coming up with plots on their own, which were then fleshed out into the series of novels called The Traveler's League, about time-traveling children. But now he's trying his hand at nonfiction on something that he feels very strongly about and uh, has some relevance to what Sharon and I do the rest of the week. The new book is Unplugging Babel, and we're honored to welcome to the program for the first time, Nick Goss. Absolutely. Thank you, Derek, for having me on. It's, it's, an on, it's always fun to talk to you. Uh, it's always when you've come and uh, interviewed with me and my brother, we've always just really enjoyed our conversations. But it's a real I, treat to be on your show. Well, I should mention that uh, you and Jonathan are the hosts of The Goslings, which is uh, one of my favorite podcasts to guest on. And uh, so I, I will put a link to that in the notes as well. I highly recommend your program to uh, people who are watching this program. Um, Unplugging Babel. Yep. This is something Sharon and I have talked about for quite a while. We've uh, touched on it a few times in uh, our series, Unraveling Revelation, and then hanging around with the likes of the... Uh, Recently, but already recently departed, but already uh, m dearly missed Dr. Tom Horn, uh, who was one of the first to warn about the dangers of technology and transhumanism. Um, you you dive right into it. Um, be before we get into the, the nature of the book um, and the reasons that you wrote it, uh, l l let me just ask this. How much did being a father of two very intelligent kids uh, how much of a role did that play how much inspiration was that for the writing of unplugging Babel? well there, there was quite a bit actually uh, of, of inspiration being a father and knowing about the dangers of let's just just to say social media in general and hearing the statistics and hearing horror stories and trying to be a conscientious parent and you know trying to keep you know guard your kids and shield your kids from that uh and when I started going on this journey, which really started for me in, during Lent, I decided that the thing I was going to give up was social media, and I kind of did it just on the fly without really thinking about what I was committing myself to, thinking it would be easy and everyone think would think that I was giving up something difficult, which is awful. But uh, I was like, yeah, I'll just give up social media. So I tried it, and uh, I realized... Um, all the things that I was shielding my kids from, I was addicted to. Oh. And I also realized as a parent that kids are not going to do what you say. They're going to <laughs> model your behavior. Uh, and, you know, you know, as a Christian parent, 
uh, you want to talk, you, you, you tell your kids, oh, the, you know, you got you to gotta stay in God's word, you got to worship. Well, if your kids don't see you reading the Bible, you can tell them to read the Bible and you can make them read the Bible. But when they're adults, they're going to naturally try to replicate what they saw in their parents. That's going to manifest. It's not necessarily what their parents told them to do or the habits that their parents tried to instill. They're going to replicate the behavior. So if they don't see you worshiping, if they don't see you in God's word, if they see you instead engaged with the screen, with the electric glow of entertainment constantly, uh, then they're going to think that that's a perfectly fine substitute and they'll be exposed to everything that gushes forth, you know, from, from the internet, social media in particular. So I had that in mind. Yeah, it was, in, it was, it was definitely part of the inspiration. And you know, another thing too, and if I'm talking too much, please interrupt me, but, uh, I, I have a son and you know, there's, you know, video game addiction is a real thing for a lot of people, a lot of kids, especially boys. I know that's out there. I know there are negative mental health consequences from allowing that to develop in a child. And we try really hard to monitor that. We didn't, we've, we never took a stand and said, you can't play video games. You're not going to do that. You're not going to be, you're not going to do that. You know, we've had to have this, you know, measured approach. There are boundaries. You can do it on the weekends when you're over at your grandmother's house, but you can't do it when you're here at home. You know, which is pretty extreme compared to the standard. But even with that, even setting those tight boundaries where it's not really in our home, it's still a struggle. You know, it still dominates the thinking of, 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 a, of a young person. So video games, social media, you know, the, just, just the exposure to it for, in a young person, in a child, just the exposure to it, it sits in their brain. It's, it just churns. It's all they think about. Even they just exposed to it for a little bit. And uh, it affects their mood. And uh, it's, it's, it's the most bizarre thing I've ever seen, how just a little bit of it will completely, you can't even say would wet their whistle, but just a dose, it's almost like a drug. Mm -hmm. Just a dose of it is enough to make them crave it and need to come back, not want to come back, but almost like they need to come back. And it affects their mood until their brain either resets or they go back to it and they get their next, you know, dopamine hit and these are in mm -hmm. brains that are still developing too by the way yeah. they can't handle right. this they can't and, handle and, and, this and it, onslaught you know of it, it physically rewires their brains because they're awash in the dopamine as their brains are, are developing uh, you know pornography does the same thing that's right yeah Th this is right. something that that's is right. uh, and so and, so, uh, social actually, media is actually uh, is actually uh, designed to constantly hit you with with dopamine i mean i i cannot i physically cannot stand tiktok um we've used it a little yeah, bit agreed but but cannot use it but it's designed intentionally to generate that hit with the 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 rapid fire video uh, uh and uh to to uh instill almost an addiction to uh to that kind of rush that you get from watching it yeah, that's right. And you have to remember, too, that, uh, you know, the TikToks and the metas and, um, you know, the, uh, the X's, you know, these, these companies on these social media platforms on which advertising is being, you know, put out there, right? That's where their revenue is coming from. These companies have spent multi-billions of dollars on the smartest people scientists, um, psychologists, and engineers to create the most addictive hardware and software for the end user to guarantee they will come back. They wanted a digitally uh, a addictive product and put it out there for free. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what they're doing. And when it, you know, an, a very interesting uh, statistic about what happens in a child's brain uh, it came from a book that I actually referenced in, in in my book, Unplugging Babel. But one author that was also very inspiring to me is Dr. Nicholas Cardaris. Uh, he's a sociologist. Uh, he runs a series of treatment centers that are really geared towards people trying to come out of um, 
addiction to technology, addiction to essentially their digital devices. So it's not just social media, but these are treatment centers for adults. But he cites a study in which uh, they, they, uh, they monitored the brain uh, development of young boys. You know, as we know, the brain develops, it takes a long time. In, in adult males, the brain doesn't stop it developing. It's fully developed right around age 22-ish in an adult brain, right around there somewhere. So these young men who develop this video game addiction, as they're growing and going through those teenage years, uh, and that brain is trying to develop, what happens is the prefrontal cortex, which is the last part of the brain to fully develop, it's the critical thinking part of your brain. It's also the part of the brain that regulates uh, your response to things, how you react to things. When they, what they found was that when young people were engaged, you know, when, it, when it was interactive, when they were engaged with the screen and it was interactive, which you know, usually means video games. It can also mean social media too. But in young men in particular doing video games, what they found was while they were engaged with the game, that part of the brain development paused. And, on, in, and not just paused. And you got to think, you know, how many hours a day is a child or a young person engaged in this activity where that part of the brain ceases its development? How many hours in a day over how many years? They mm. found that not only does that part of the brain stop developing, it starts shrinking. So here you have a 22-year-old, 23-year-old adult who has no ability to restrain themselves when, they, when adversity hits them. They don't know how to cope because that part of the brain that regulates how they react has been not just undeveloped, but it's actually been diminished. So they resort to drastic overreaction whether it's hurting other people which nobody wants to address uh, school shootings I mean there are a lot of factors that go into that but when you think about a young person and they have no ability to cope with adversity and those emotions that are raging and they see opportunity and an easy way to lash out that could very well happen, and nobody's looking into that. Nobody's researching, you know, uh, were any, and I'll, I'll bet you, Derek, I'll bet you $100 that most of these mass shooters, these young people that go out and make these horrible decisions, I'll bet most of them had an addiction to some sort of digital device or uh, video game addiction or social media addiction, and they couldn't pull away. You know, it's really creating a mental health, it's really an epidemic. It's what's causing a lot of our, uh, in adults, anxiety and depression. But in young people, it's almost like they don't have a chance. They don't even have a chance in today's culture. They're digital mm. natives. They're growing up from birth with a device in their hand or in their face, and they're engaging with it and interacting with it. You, you mentioned in the book that uh, you know those of us who are baby boomers, and I'm on the tail end of the baby boom, Gen Xers, uh, we remember a day before cell phones. I, I remember when I was uh, selling real estate 30 years ago and I had to carry a bag phone around because I needed to be in contact with people. But uh, now we all have uh, a phone with us 24-7. And, you know, I had done some interviews on, on this, this round-the-clock access to the internet in, in the context of uh, kids being groomed by uh, predators. Um, and that is a serious problem. Uh, Opal Singleton Hendershot and her millionkids.org has done some really great work on exposing that and uh, showing how easily kids uh, who's, uh, well, you know, <laughs> frontal lobes are not fully developed. If you've got, you know, a full set of adult hormones at age 14, but you're not thinking clearly and how easily those ch kind of kids can be drawn into uh, all sorts of uh, uh, awful behavior. But I had not really considered the, um, not just the, the mental health, but also the spiritual issues connected with the shrinking of the prefrontal cortex. I mean, this is almost, mm. uh, you know, if I were a conspiracy theorist, and I know I am, this would almost seem to be a deliberate spiritual kneecapping of an entire generation. 
Yeah, I would agree with you. You know, the premise of the book Unplugging Babel is that uh, it, Babylon itself is essentially what we've created in the internet. It's a worldwide city. And sitting in the middle of that now with the, you know, with the uh, rise of artificial intelligence, we have the tower. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of Christians, when when uh, ChatGPT last year, early last year, really kind of came to public, you know, the public awareness, and the world was just on fire about the possibilities of artificial intelligence, but a lot of Christians were like, man, this doesn't feel right. There's something wrong about this. There's something non-human about this. And, and it, you know, we've had a hard time really putting our thumb on it, right? Putting our finger on exactly what it is that is in our spirit saying, ah, let's just slow down a little bit. But the premise of the book is that we know that what we read about in Revelation 13, uh, for example, the mark of the beast, animating the image, how the world's going to be controlled, you know, people will be able to receive them. You know, I, I, the premise of the book is that what we're reading about is transhumanism being coerced across everyone globally. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't happen overnight. You know, this technology isn't just going to be suddenly embedded our, in our biology. And that system is going to suddenly exist when the Antichrist comes on the scene. There's not enough time. This has been, this has been built brick by brick over decades now. You know, it's kind of like, um, I was thinking about this the other day. Transhumanism is very much like UFOs, right? There, you, there's, there's a, a ladder of disclosure with rungs on the ladder when it comes to, you know, UFOs. Some people believe in them, some people don't. We know that there's something that people are seeing. Our government can't even explain it, but they acknowledge it's there, and to an extent they even acknowledge it's non-human origin, at least in some of the technology. But they've been softly giving us a little more, a little more, a little more, because they don't want a war of the world scenario. You know, back in 1936, what was it? The Orson Welles War of the Worlds fiasco. 38, I think, but uh, yeah, somewhere in there, yeah. They don't want mass panic. So they're, we're being given a little more. They're acknowledging a little more. There's a rung on the ladder. Transhumanism's no different. The mark, that's how the mark of the beast is going to come on the scene, is that one rung on the ladder is a worldwide web. We're all connected. Another rung is where you can have access to that, you know, it, not just in your homes, but everywhere. Another rung is that, well, you can't start your car or maybe you can't access the building. Another rung is that, well, it doesn't have to be like you holding it in your hand or, you know, we'll just strap it to your wrist like Apple did. Another mm -hmm. rung will be, well, we're just going to do eyeglasses, just eyeglasses. You know, at some point, there's going to be a rung where you don't have to worry. The, the body's going to be a nuisance. You're going to forget to, you know, you, you don't want to break your device and have to replace it. Let's just slip it under the skin, put it under the mm -hmm. palm, put it under the mm -hmm. wrist, maybe implant AI-enabled contact lenses, which sounds so ludicrous. Like 10, 15 years ago, if you were to say that, you'd be like, that's ridiculous, stupid. No one's going to do mm -hmm. that. But it's around the corner. I mean, it's right around the corner. You know, and what we have to remember is that on, as, as cool as these things sound, we're getting closer and closer to something. Technology is progressing in a very definite direction. And I believe that direction, I believe the end point is what we read about in Revelation 13. Hmm. You draw some parallels between Babel as it's described, and we don't know a whole lot about it. There's not much mentioned about it in Genesis chapter 11, but... Um, En enough there to draw some conclusions about what it was that uh, prompted God to intervene personally. And you got to go pretty far for God to personally say, okay, I, you're making me come down there. Um, and what's going on today? What, what do you see in the culture around us today and specifically technology that you see as a parallel to the kingdom of Nimrod? Well, the number one thing is that we're trying to make ourselves God. We're trying to become omniscient, omnipresent. Uh, we're, we're trying to be omnipotent by utilizing artificial intelligence to scale us 
we want to scale humans. That's what Imad Motsak said. He's the founder of Stability AI. And he was bragging about his company has discovered how they can scale humans. Make scale them more humans. Capable. To scale humans. What? To scale humans. What and what mean that means that? is, what he means by that is when you think about what is the value of a human being to a company, for example, as an employee, what's the value of a human being as an employee? Well, it's their ability to produce, their ability to produce. So AI can scale that. They can produce more if they know how to use AI. Okay. Uh, they can scale their customer because if the customer is also using artificial intelligence or engaging with their artificial, artificial intelligent software or platform, whatever they're using to promote their products, or maybe they're selling AI itself. But if the customer is using AI, they can scale up their consumerism. If, you know, a, another great example is how governments, I mean, they love all of the possibilities of being able to scale up their ability to monitor and control uh, their citizens. Mm -hmm. So AI enables everything that we have right now that's wonderful about digital technology is going to be augmented by artificial intelligence. It can just make things happen faster in greater quantities. I mean, it's exponential what AI can do for you instead of you do it for yourself online. And uh, he wasn't really talking about, he wasn't talking about like, um, you know, uh, artificial limbs, you know, he wasn't talking about using AI to uh, help the blind see or the lame walk or the deaf hear, even though we've heard some of those promises from the likes of Elon Musk and how that type of technology would be, you know, in the medical field would be just, you know, just miraculous to help people. No, what, he, what Ahmad was talking about was the ability of humans to be more than what they are, to do more than what they are, to solve problems faster, think faster, uh, reach more solutions, decide which solutions are the right ones, uh, to just make themselves more than what a human being is typically capable mm. of. And I think that that's a good parallel to what was going on in Babylon or in Babel at the time. Uh, they, had, they had all come together. They had congregated in this city that they were very proud of. And they were building a tower with a very specific purpose. They wanted to essentially, they wanted to call the shots for themselves at a divine level. And they wanted to make themselves their own gods. And AI, AI's promise is that it does that, is that we can scale ourselves. We can rely more on it, and it will allow us to do more, uh, that we don't have to rely on our own faculties. And we certainly don't re need to rely mm. on the assistance of some invisible sky god. When we can be more effective using AI in our own lives than we could if we were to just trust the Almighty. It sounds like it uh, rolls Genesis 3, 6, and 11 all into one. Ye shall be as gods. No, seriously, we'll merge, you, we'll, we'll merge with you and make you gods, and then uh, you will be in contact with the... Uh, it's, it's the same old lie, and I guess it keeps uh, getting rolled out by the fallen realm because it keeps working. It does keep working. <clears throat> and what I would ask people to consider... One of the questions I asked in the book, and I asked you just briefly, is that as you're looking at all the possibilities of art artificial intelligence and using that, ask yourself, you know, does AI enable us to be more Christ-like? <laughs> or does it enable us to be a little more like something non-human? If AI was a way to make us more human, I'd be a little more interested, but it's kind of getting us to think that we can be more than what we are. It doesn't help us reach more of the lost. It doesn't help us. It doesn't develop a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit in us. You know, I don't see how it can be anything but a distraction to our relationship with the divine, with God. Because if he, if he really wanted us to have the capability that AI promises, why didn't he create us with that? You know, I think for – 
sounded like you had a question. Oh no, I was just or a was response. about to, and and and, nope, and you were getting ready to go ahead, and I, I didn't want to jump in there, but uh, no, as you were, it just so continue on, and then I'll jump in with a question here. Yeah, well, I uh, and I don't mean to ramble, and I hope I'm not all over the place, but you know, when you think about <clears throat> the world and the explosion of technology over the past, say, hundred and 170, 150, 170 years. And you look at the, you look at that you step back and look across the entire, you know, the entire timeline of recorded history. And to compare that to a clock face, let's just say a 12 hour clock face. For the first 11 hours and 45 minutes, we were riding horses, building fires planting and growing, sailing on ships, like with wind and sails and rowing. It's just in the last 15 minutes that we've been driving cars, the last five minutes that we've had the internet and digital technology, and in the last few seconds that artificial intelligence has come on the scene and is really threatening to disrupt everything. And so when you see that explosion of knowledge in the last 15 minutes of a clock face, let's say, a 12 hour clock face. And then you read the passage in Daniel where it says knowledge will be greatly increased in the last days. Those are two. I think that's what it means. I don't hmm. see how it could mean anything, anything other than that, to be honest with you. The uh, COVID lockdowns really broke the bonds of fellowship for a lot of churches. Uh, a lot of Protestant, especially mainline denominations were already shrinking pretty quickly. Uh, I've got a friend in here with me. Uh, yeah, we, we had the uh, big barn door open uh, <laughs> to move equipment in here yesterday, and we got a few flies that have come in. And so, okay. yeah. Um, it's just a fly, though. It's not like a bat or something? No, something no, no. Something like uh, just, menacing? Uh, okay, good. <laughs> as long as the flies don't start multiplying, you know, and, and, and turning into some sort of Stephen King horror show, we'll, we'll be all right. Um, I, unfortunately, I left a fly swatter on the other table. Um, the... Uh, the COVID lockdowns really were a problem for a lot of churches, and uh, there were those that started using um, uh, the the internet to connect. Uh, we all learned how to uh, use Zoom over the last few years, it really against my will. It's you know it's a Chinese company; they're spying, and you stop using it. Um, but <laughs> our kids, those of us, you know, our daughter's well past the age where she uh, needs to uh, you know sit in front of a screen to for education purposes. But this is, I presume, something that you had to deal with. Um, wh- how did this sudden disconnect? where kids were suddenly separated from their friends. We were separated from our church congregations. Um, and we were suddenly compelled and forced to use this technology to connect with one yeah. another. How is that yeah. driving this agenda? Well, that's something I go into in the book. You know, it's, it was interesting. One of the things that happened during COVID <clears throat> was not only did a lot of churches shudder uh, in congregations dwindled, as we all know, after COVID, you know, there was a significant, like 40% of the people that stopped going to church during COVID didn't come back. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a huge blow. Uh, but during COVID, what's interesting is that not only could churches physically gather, but there was a there was a a halt in new church startups. And one of the reasons for that, and I think this is part of the larger agenda, one of the reasons for that is that as a church, you have to be able to physically congregate in order to get approved by the IRS as a 501c or recognized as a 501c3 organization as a Uh. church specifically. It's Mm -hmm. one of the things they require. And there's some reasons for that, but you can't start a church and get all of the special privileges that churches uniquely have as 501c3s, unlike other types of 501c3s. Churches don't file federal returns. They don't have to register to fundraise, right? They're hands off. The state and the government, the state and the IRS have to be hands off when it comes to churches. But they have to get that formal recognition in order for that to be the case. Uh, But there were no churches started during COVID because you weren't allowed to physically congregate. So if you wanted to start a church, uh, you could still incorporate an entity, you could get its 501c3 status as a religious organization, 
but not uniquely as a church. And if you were to do that as just a religious organization, you'd have to report to the IRS every year. You'd have to report to the state every year. You'd have to disclose your financials and your activities. So it forced, you know, and if any new organizations that started that wanted to otherwise be churches, they were in a situation where now the government had more insight and control, oversight into what those religious organizations were doing. They were just churches. So that's part of the agenda. Mm. Um, I think that in, in COVID necessitated our reliance on technology, or on the internet in particular, because we got addi- We were already addicted. We were already addicted to social media. We were already, you know, binging Netflix and all those things. But COVID was the nail in the coffin. There was really no coming back because even when the lockdowns lifted, the behaviors didn't change. Kids didn't, kids, you know, were actually excited about going back to school, but the schools were, they've been playing catch up ever since. Yeah. It didn't affect, it didn't really impact uh, my kids, uh, my wife and I, because we've, you know, we were blessed to be able to homeschool. Uh. So, you know, we don't, we never did Zoom classroom and there's nothing wrong with public school. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying, oh, 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 look at us. It didn't have the impact on us uh, because we were already doing it here in our home, and, and, and it was great. But a lot of kids really suffered. And, um, you know, the, one, of the, one, of, one of the more nefarious things that happened, is, as you probably know, and probably a lot of parents realize, that uh, when kids were in, trying to engage in the classroom setting virtually— you know, there are a lot of parents that weren't allowed to view what the what was on the child's screen. Right. They weren't allowed to hear what the teacher was saying in their own homes for the privacy of the other students. Mm-hmm. And not only that, not only could you not look at your child's screen in your own home, how, how come the school can look at everything that's in your home and the other people walking around and you don't get to say they can't look at that? Right. You know, it's just, it's, it, it became super invasive and we became comfortable with it. And we just kind of resigned ourselves to that reality that now this is, this is how the world is. Yeah. It's the same with working from home. It's a disturbing two way window that we've sort of gotten used to. And and I would just add this, this one thing, uh, just because it hits kind of close to home. Friends of ours, uh, at uh, Morningside, the Jim Baker show was sued because of, um, a product that they offered during, you know, the early days of COVID and claims were made by the state's attorneys or the attorneys general in Missouri, Arkansas, New York, uh, which, which were way beyond what actually was said on the program. I, I think the actual agenda, when I find out what these attorneys general were trying to get is more nefarious because they were trying to compel Morningside to give up the donor lists which would have set a precedent then that mm. an attorney general in another state, if they don't like something that you're saying on the Internet, if you're a church, say, in rural North Dakota, and you've got a YouTube channel, and they don't like something that you said, and they come after you and say, you're under investigation for X, Y, Z here in uh, Orange County, uh, California, we're going to compel you to give up all of your donors and, and disclose who is supporting you and where they are, and, and so on. Yep. And they, they were able to successfully defend themselves against that, uh, against those charges. But uh, that, I think, was really what was behind this. And, of course, Jim Baker, being a kind of a lightning rod for criticism, made an easy target for the government in that in that regard. But I think it, it's even worse yep. because, as you say, during COVID, both because we had to work remotely and uh, many children had to learn remotely, we've sort of gotten used to the idea that now there are cameras looking into our homes and not all of us are really careful about uh, where those cameras are pointed and what they might, what might be in front of those cameras, um, especially in our kids' rooms. There have been some real horrific stories about uh, uh, schools where the tech guy at the school was activating cameras on the school issued laptops in the bedrooms of these uh, 11 and 12 and 13 year old students. It's uh, yeah. yeah, there there's, you know, not, not to take the program in that direction. Cause that's really not no, what okay. uh, unplugging Babel is about, but I mean, uh, you know, this is something that uh, issues that our parents didn't have to deal with when all they had to do was to, you know, uh, keep us away from the three network television uh, stations <laughs> 
days <laughs> when there was a program yeah. on that they thought was inappropriate. Yeah. And now, yeah. 24-7, we not only have our children viewing what's uh, you know, th- this... Uh, the, the sum total of human depravity accessible through the internet, but the fact is, there's somebody on the other side with a camera looking into their bedrooms. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, and and if if you're one of those people that trusts the engineers and the monitors and the sensors and the people who work behind the curtain at these social media platforms, if you trust them to not look through your photos and not watch your videos, if you trust they would never turn your camera on, they can't turn your camera on. Can they turn your camera on? They can turn your microphone on because that's how they market to you. Surveillance capitalism is a thing and it's been a thing for years. We all know about it. And I can't stand this attitude about how it's just, well, that's just how it is, man. I, you know, nothing I can do about it. Here, here's my privacy. If you're not doing anything wrong, you got nothing to worry about. Yeah, well, you hear, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that was kind of the attitude, but now it's right. like, hey, I wasn't doing anything wrong ten years ago when I was a religious conservative, and and a Christian Zionist. Hmm. Hmm. But today, I'm essentially a radical domestic terrorist because my views hasn't my views haven't changed. I've been a <laughs> I'm a stalwart American. Yes, but the Overton window has shifted so far to the left that I'm an right. extremist now. Uh-huh, so at uh-huh. some point, and we all know this, at some point we will have something to hide, not because we did anything different, but because we we, we we believed the same truth and we lived the same way. But culture has shifted, so there yeah. will come a point where these people who say, "Well, I don't care," they know everything about me anyway. It doesn't matter. I've got nothing to hide. There's going to come a point where they'll through no fault of their own, they're going to wish they had been hiding mm-hmm. their, their um, private details. We're, we're only going to scratch the surface of what uh, what you go into in the book. And the book is relatively short, so it's, it's a fairly quick read, yeah. but I think it's right yeah. on point in a lot of these issues. But one of the issues you brought up was I, I found very fascinating because this is an area that Sharon and I have researched quite a bit. We wrote the book Veneration about the uh, the the ancient cult of the Nephilim and the occult doctrines that it ha- uh, has inspired that continue down to this day. As we just passed the Day of the Dead here in uh, uh, in in, yeah. the, in North America, uh, Halloween, of course, uh, <laughs> all derives, believe it or not, and we document that in the book of you know from the the worship of the ancestors who were in fact the demonic spirits of the giants destroyed in the flood of noah you bring up artificial intelligence and teraphim the household Ah, gods in ancient mesopotamia in the same context the teraphim were used as part of these rituals to worship the ancestors Um, how does that connect that practice venerating the spirits to ai and technology well, you know what's interesting is that, yeah, the teraphim. There were these. There were the the household gods. The teraphim were the household gods of those you know, Canaanite tribes and pre-Canaanite tribes, and um, they would pray to them. They would, uh, you know, petition the favor of these gods. Uh, they would carry them with them everywhere. They were used for divination. Mm-hmm. You know, they would petition the household gods. Some were big, some were small, you know, but they were idols that you kept in your home and you would petition them and go to them for divination. You know, artificial intelligence uh, claims to be vastly more intelligent than we are and can give us with authority instead of a thousand results. It can give us one authoritative result when we ask it a question. And... When we start using artificial intelligence and we start asking it questions in our quest to know more about the world and who created the world and what scripture might have to say about those things, when we start employing these powerful AI search models to give us insight into the divine, it's my belief that I think we're employing something that could easily be sitting behind this technology ready to give us a deceptive answer. We already use our smartphones like they're household gods in a way. (laughs) And for those of you who don't believe me, how connected to your smartphone are you? When was the last time, and I don't mean to be crude, you went to the bathroom without it? (laughs) 
We're talking sacred spaces in the home, Derek. Sacred spaces. Yeah, yeah. You know, when was the last time you went to bed and it wasn't lying on the nightstand next to your next to your head while you slept? When was the last time you I could go on and on. Yeah. But we treat these things that we've put we've we've structured our daily lives so that there's so much of our day to day that is administered through this little black window and we live our lives so much through it that if you were to set it aside how long could you go <laughs> at what point does it become at what what point does it become an idol if people say those struggling with alcoholism alcohol's become an idol in their lives and they say and I'll prove it by taking the bottle away from you well, I can prove the same thing by taking the smartphone away from someone who doesn't think they're addicted. Mm -hmm. And they realize, wow, you know, I really do need this. I, you know, I need this. I really need this. You know, and I don't mean to get too far off topic, but, you know, there is a, there are two levels of addiction that come along with this. With social media and the interactivity of these apps, there is a dopamine loop, right? There's a chemical addiction in the brain that we've developed using these apps. And when you get rid of the app, let's say you get rid of social media and you still have the smart device, there might, you might not have the dopamine loop, but there's still the behavioral addiction that you have to face. There are two levels of this that you're going against. So that's the difference between the smartphone and the teraphim or the social media and AI on a smart device and the teraphim in that what we have now is way more dangerous hmm. because it does talk back to you. It does give you answers. And you can take it everywhere with you, and it'll give answers to your children. And uh, you you made reference or alluded to something behind the uh, the AI, ready to give us a deceptive answer. What, what specifically did you mean? Well, there's been a, there's been chatter about you know, from some of the uh, uh, engineers. There's a Google en I think it was a Google engineer that was working on there. Uh, artificial intelligence platform. I reference it in the book. I can't remember his name, uh, but he believed that AI was sentient. He even said that his personality was demonic. He mm. didn't know how to interact with it. What was coming back to him as he was working with this AI personality was, was shocking. Um, I've talked, you know, Gary Wayne has talked a little bit about this in one of the interviews we do with him on the Goslings, but it's not unreasonable to suspect that artificial intelligence could act as almost like an oikotarion for a, a, a demonic, sinister presence or personality or being to deceive us all. It's not beyond the pale to think that if an angel that we all believe in, ostensibly believe in angels and that they can physically manifest well, why couldn't a fallen angel or even a, or even a wandering spirit, a demon, is it beyond a pill to think that they might be able to speak through technology? That this could be an oikotarion for them manipulating us and drawing? I mean, why would they even do it if not to draw our attention away from, from the ministry, from our relationship with God, from our relationship with one another, from what we're supposed to be doing in the church, from keeping our eyes open and looking for the signs. God tells us, Christ told us to be watchful. You know, we're, but we, we're not being watchful when, our, <laughs> when we're like this all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that uh, we are, I think that we're crippling ourselves. I think we're putting ourselves in a situation of disadvantage. I think we've been just giving a little more, offering a little more dependence on technology, a little more, just a little more, a little more, like rungs on a ladder. And eventually, at some point, and for many people, they're already here, but at some point, they've relied so much that it's almost impossible for them to take a step back. And mm -hmm. what the problem with that is, if I'm right about transhumanism and artificial intelligence, and that be uh, the manifold through which we see the events of Revelation 13, the mark of the beast, controlling the world, who can buy, who can sell, who doesn't, who lives, who dies. 
if I'm right and what we're seeing in Revelation 13 is these technologies, we as Christians need to be careful, especially if we are pre, uh, pre-trib rapture Christians, because we think, well, we can, I can use all this technology. I'm not going to be here when the mark of the beast rolls around because, you know, we're, go- we're going to be raptured, right? We won't even be here. So it's not the mark of the beast to me. It's not going to do any, I can use it for great purposes because I won't be here when it's turned on humanity, right? Mm-hmm. But what does that say to the non-believers that have walked alongside us up to the point of the rapture and us just using all of this technology, like if there's nothing to worry about, there's nothing to worry about, well, I'm out of here, have fun with your leash. Mm. What example are we setting for the people who are going to be left behind if, if that is the case, that there will be a pre-trib rapture? We've got to be careful about that. Mm. You know, we need to be aware of, you know, these prophecies and be watchful and just not jump on them like the newest thing is the greatest thing because it's the newest thing, you know. Yeah. Let's not adapt and, and things suggest, so quickly that we're blinded by deception. And, and I would suggest also that uh, a, as a pre-trib Christian believer that we should not hold on to our uh, interpretation of what is not manifestly clear in Scripture and I, you know, even though I, I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, I, I don't think it's explicit. Well, no, it is not explicit in Scripture. Um, That's right. So, so maybe we should just be open to the possibility that we could be wrong about this. I mean, certainly the apostles who learned directly from Jesus for three years didn't understand his first coming and the prophecies thereof until after, you know, Pentecost. Uh, so we're probably not going to understand the prophecies of the second coming and all of that until we see it in the rearview, see them in the rearview mirror. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think, uh, that is a, a, yeah. a good word of wisdom and, and caution. Um, Nick is, uh, uh, I, I don't want to you know, take up your entire evening, uh, again, cognizant of the fact that you've got kids in your home who need uh, father's, uh, <laughs> attention and direction. Um, what what is the recommendation then for us as believers? How do because you're 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 speaking to me, I mean, Sharon and I we are into technology. I'm I'm looking around this this room I'm in, and I can see about eight internet connected devices just within line yeah. of sight. Yeah. So what I what I mention in the book uh, is there there are three things that you can do. Three things that you can do. I took drastic measures for myself, and I write about that in the book. I got off social media, I ditched my smartphone, and I've learned to live without it, and it's been wonderful. And I go into why that's the case in the book. But for people who aren't quite ready for that, that still want, that, that are still cognizant, that, cognizant of the fact that this is kind of moving in a bad direction, they want to do something. First of all, I would say, define your boundaries, especially in your home, in your churches, and in how you do relationships with other people. Draw boundaries across which you will not let that technology cross, cross, right? So we're not going to use AI in my home. We're not going to use it to create art, write books, to do anything that is the free creative expression that comes from an image bearer, right? God created us to to be creatives like him and we're cheating that and trying to make ourselves more than what God created us to be when we use AI. So I'm teaching my children to be creative. They use technology, but don't use AI to create your art, to write, to make movies, to make music. You know, that needs to come from your soul. So that those are my boundaries. Those are my boundaries. So I would just encourage people to define their own boundaries. The second thing is I would say, this is going to sound crazy, learn to use some AI platforms for your work because you will, we're going to live in a world, the workforce in which will be permeated with artificial intelligence enabled technology. And the people, I think it was um, Mogadot who was the uh, chief, one of the chief business executives for Google X that developed Google's version of AI. Uh, He said that people are afraid they're going to lose their job to artificial intelligence. And that's not the case. People are going to lose their jobs to people who know how to use 
artificial intelligence. So I think that it is wise in the workplace, whether you're employed by someone else or whether you're self-employed, get comfortable with it, learning to use some of these platforms. But you keep it out of your church, your home, and your relationships. And just try to find a, a, a trying to find some balance of you, you have to participate in the world, but you don't have to be of the world. It doesn't have to the culture just because the culture is using AI doesn't mean it has to permeate the culture of the family, the culture of the home, the culture of the church. So I would say learn to use AI. Um, and uh, I would say get vocal about your decisions and where you draw the line. Encourage other people. Do the same. I, you know, I encourage people through the book. I'm trying to. I want to encourage people out there that have always wanted to step away from social media or smart devices or are just really scared about AI and they don't want anything to do with it. And they, they feel maybe they feel alone in believing those things. I want to encourage them. You are not alone. You can reach out to me. I'll do it. I'll tell you right now. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Just with smart, just getting off smartphones. When I went in to get, when I got rid of my smartphone about six months ago, and I went in to get this cheap flip phone, and they have nicer, there are nicer options. There are nicer options, I will say. But I got the cheap one. Uh, the young man who was helping facilitate that at the Verizon store, uh, he didn't judge me. He hmm. actually said, you know, you're not the first person this week to come in here and do that. There are a lot of people that are just, they're just simplifying. So I just want people to feel like, I just want you to know you're not alone. If you want to, if you want to take a chance, you want to see what it feels like to just disengage from it. Maybe do a Sabbath, a tech, a tech free Sabbath. Maybe just fast for a meal. Can you have dinner with your family without having a phone around? Oh yeah. Just try that. Just one meal. Just do one meal. Try it out. Then do a Sabbath and then maybe do it for Lent. Just all of Lent if you can, you know, but and talk about it. Tell people why you're doing it. And if you're brave or if you're stupid like me and you want to just be crazy, nuke your Facebook account, get ditch your smart device and just get a regular phone and call me or text me and we'll chat and I'll support you because I'll, I will applaud what you've done because you've, you've removed it from a, you, you have taken back control of the way you communicate with other people how you share the gospel. And that's another thing I talk about in the book, you know, uh, how <laughs> social media is not a mission field. Uh, what? But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yep. Yep. I know. Sure. The gospel of memes. <laughs> Wasn't it the fifth gospel, the book of memes, the, the gospel memes, according yeah. to memes. Yeah. Derek, Me you'd be memes so of the apostles. surprised. Man, I got so much pushback from that statement when I was telling people about that part of the book that I was writing. People mm -hmm. in my family were like, you can't write that. That's not true. And they would argue with me. They're like, absolutely. Yeah. This is, what other mission field do we have? And that was really alarming to me. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you 100%. Just seeing the way people interact via social media that uh, people don't really look to have their ideas or their thoughts, their their worldview changed through social media. They're looking for worldview confirmation they're looking for bias confirmation so uh yeah, yeah. Your, your a snappy meme is not going to change somebody's worldview it's just simply going to confirm it or inflame somebody who's on the other side and then that's going to lead to some really uh, destructive uh interactions so yeah i i agree social media yeah. is not a mission field we use social media to try to direct people to our content but uh yeah the uh the memes Mm, no, no. <laughs> so I have a younger brother who lives out in Idaho. His name is Rob, and he's an associate pastor of the church we grew up in. And it is a thriving church, spirit-filled church. And I was visiting this past summer when I was putting together my thoughts for this book, and I shared this concept with him that social media is not the mission field, thinking, surely he's going to disagree with me as a pastor. This, you know, great, hip, thriving church. He's a young guy. And uh, he agreed with me as a pastor, and he said, you know, our opinion of, and I, I love this, social media is not the church. The church does not exist in social media. Social media is just the porch where we stand out and say, hey, everybody, come in here to where the ministry really is. 
Yeah, it's to yeah. get people into the church. It's not to do the ministry of the church. And I thought that was a great, uh, great metaphor. Babel, a, a technological wonder that will uh, lead the world right into the open arms of the beast. Uh, Nick Goss is the author of the new book, Unplugging Babel, a manifesto against AI, smartphones, and social media. Well worth reading, especially if you are a parent, a grandparent, uh, especially if you are addicted. As and, and again, you're preaching the choir here when you're talking about you know taking the phones places they shouldn't ought to go. I probably ought to sanitize my phone, you know, now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, <laughs> I'll just stop there. But yes, uh, well, well worth reading. And uh, we will put links in the show notes to uh, where you can find a copy of the book. Of course, the, the irony here is that uh, Nick offered to send us a review copy, a hard copy. And I said, do you have an electronic copy? And then, of course, it dawned on me. It's like, oh, wait, because that means I'll be reading it through my, uh, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, there it is. Anyway, well, Nick, I made a thank special you. exception for you. Special I exception pre- for you, Darren. And I appreciate that because when you get to a certain <laughs> age, you know, guys of a certain age, being able to size the font larger uh, really, really helps. Uh, I understand. Thanks for taking time out of your schedule and uh, look forward to joining you and Jonathan on the Goslings with uh, Sharon uh, later this month. Yes, sounds great. We're looking forward to it. This has been really fun. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about the new book. Check the show notes, whether it's at uh, vftb.net, youtube.com slash at Gilbert House, or wherever you're watching this podcast for a link below as to where you can get a copy of Unplugging Babble by Nick Goss. Uh, by the way, I mentioned a two for one today. That's because earlier today, Sunday, December 3rd, Sharon and I were guests on the podcast that Nick hosts with his brother, Jonathan. Nick and Jonathan Goss, they call their program The Gosslings. Get it? Uh, you know, the you know, kids, Goss, Gosling, yeah. Uh, and uh, we, we've been uh, honored to, uh, I, I've been on the program a couple of times, really enjoyed our conversations. This is the first time that Sharon has been a guest. And uh, again, coming to you from uh, from here in the barn. Coming up, uh, we've got news on the, uh, uh, on the uh, Gilbert House Israel tour scheduled for next spring. Uh, obviously, the war between Israel and Hamas is affecting that. Also, a conference to tell you about in early April that coincides with the total eclipse of the sun. That and bless their pointy little heads straight ahead on a view from the bunker. Sharon and I really appreciate your support, and that's why every single month we want to make a special offer available to you at the Gilbert House store. And now that we're into the holidays, we're oh. offering extra special specials. We really are. You know, last year we had some holiday specials that people just really enjoyed getting. Lots and lots of you uh, went and, and ordered there, and we thank you for that. We're doing the same thing this year. Lots of great deals, including Red Wing Saga specials, Derek's book specials, and blowout prices on all of our DVDs. Yes, but if you prefer streaming video, so you get instant access in full HD. And no shipping. And no shipping, right. We've got special discounts available now at our online streaming site, gilberthouse.org slash video. That includes even our full-length travelogumentaries, our Wars of the Gods, Volume 1 and Volume 2, now at a special discounted price through the end of January. That is such a deal. And by the way, those of you who have loved Vicki Joy Anderson's book, They Only Come Out at Night, that book is also on special December and January. We want to make this information available to you. We understand that around the holidays, finances get a little tight. So we're offering special pricing on just about everything in our online store. We're all in the middle of a battlefield. We are. And we all need good information. Please take advantage of our special offers, gilberthouse.org slash video and gilberthouse.org slash store. And thank you for your prayers and support. Amen. the walk every Sunday night from the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. This is A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. You'll find us online at vftb.net. Also, gilberthouse.org. Online at uh, YouTube, youtube.com slash at gilberthouse. And again, please get our free mobile app on social media at View from Bunker or at Derek Gilbert on X, formerly Twitter, uh, the new social media sites, Truth Social, Gab, MeWe, Getter, uh, at Derek P. Gilbert. Well, uh, Disney has not had a good year. 
They had to bring back uh, Bob Iger, a gentleman who wanted to retire a couple of years ago. They brought him back to try to steer the company through a... Uh, a rough patch. Their stock has dropped from, uh, I think, around $200 a share uh, just two years ago to uh, less than uh, $100 a share at uh, close on Friday. It was around $92, $93, bucks, if I remember right. It was down as low as uh, in the high 70s earlier this year. Um, and that's because, uh, essentially, Disney is no longer Disney. I mean, Disney does not have the clout that it once had because it is spending more time and effort on the message than on actually producing entertaining content anymore. The most recent example, well, examples, really, two in a row that are just absolute bombs. The Marvels, which is a, um, a superhero movie that essentially just puts a bunch of feminist girl bosses into uh, lead roles, reduces Samuel L. Jackson's character Nick Fury to frankly, a, uh, a joke. And um, the, the movie, while widely applauded by social justice warriors, has been widely ignored by audiences here in the United States. Um, I'm not going to do a full review of it. Haven't seen it. Frankly, I probably won't. But uh, some of the sites that I do look at for nerd culture, uh, just keeping my fingers on you know, the pulse, uh, really just torched the film. Poor plot development, uh, just not skilled direction, and, and much more. Uh, the media, uh, the legacy media, or the uh, what they're calling the access media, those who get uh, you know the free tickets to the premieres and whatnot, hailing the Marvels movie as uh, the largest ever theatrical opening by a black female director. When in fact, this will be the biggest bomb ever directed by a black female director. The film is expected to lose between 200 and $300 million once receipts are totaled and marketing costs are accounted for. This is, by all accounts, a disaster. Now, you've got uh, that followed up by The Wish, which is uh, set to apparently top even that failure, which is falling, uh, it is fallen well below box office predictions, bringing in just $32 million over a five-day opening period, which included Thanksgiving weekend, which used to be big box office for uh, theatrical releases. You open on Thanksgiving weekend with something that you really wanted to sail into the holiday period, generate some buzz and... Um, uh, it, it just didn't happen. It fell flat. Um, according to numerous reports, The Wish is opening to empty theaters around the country. Now, media spin doctors getting out ahead of this, trying to uh, you know, argue that the movie is not actually woke. It is uh, libertarian in its messaging, but the film's producers torpedoed that in their pre-release interviews where they admitted that the whole point was to try to work as much diversity and inclusion into the messaging as possible. If you're not familiar with The Wish, it's about uh, a king in a kingdom, King Magnifico, who is, of course, a an older white guy who has the power to grant wishes, but he doesn't grant wishes to everyone, just some wishes. And his daughter, who is a precocious teen, um, together with a diverse cast, decide that this is just awful, and so they lead a rebellion against King Magnifico and uh, wind up with the queen siding with the rebels and ruling in his stead. The patriarchy is defeated. Everybody gets their own, whatever you wish for. All your wishes are now granted thanks to the intervention of Asha, the young female girl boss, and uh, it's become clear that uh, audiences are just sick of things that used to matter, like characters, good characters, and strong plot uh, has been sublimated to the message. You know, plot doesn't matter. Characters don't matter. You can just have these two-dimensional characters that are moved around like cardboard pieces to just sell the message, except people aren't buying anymore. It is sad, but Disney, which um, began buying up other intellectual properties here, in, in recent years, and this was under the direction of Bob Iger, you know, the once and future king, apparently. The uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe, which apparently has now been killed off with not just the Marvels, but I mean Thor, Love and Thunder, where the big reveal is that Jane Foster becomes Thor. I mean, Chris Hemsworth has to go to the gym and work, you know, work out hours a day in order to get the guns to make, you know, pull off the role of uh, the mighty Thor. 
Jane Foster just gets, you know, CGI. So Natalie Portman doesn't have to go through the same rigorous training. <laughs> and, and again, Thor as a girl. Um, so the Marvel Cinematic Universe is essentially, and the most recent, uh, you know, Doctor, uh, Doctor Strange film, where he becomes a secondary character in a film named for him. So they could promote the female characters above him. Um, Star Wars, likewise, that franchise pretty much dead. Indiana Jones, sadly, where Indiana Jones was reduced to a sad old white dude who's upstaged by the young feminist girl boss. Um, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Marvel Cinematic Universe. Looks like the partnership with the BBC is going to drive a final nail into the coffin of the 60-year-old Doctor Who franchise. And now it appears that Disney can't even do what made Disney famous, which is make entertaining, family-friendly animated features. So to the Mouse House, we say, bless your pointy little heads. Well... Skywatch TV's virtual conference that was originally scheduled for November has been pushed back to the spring. This is uh, titled, uh, what is titled? Confronting the Darkness. That's what, we're, uh, that's what it's uh, called. Confronting the Darkness. That'll be coming up uh, in just a couple of months. We'll give you details on that as soon as those are officially released. But we're looking at a spring release on the Skywatch TV virtual conference. I'll be doing uh, uh, a presentation on the spirits behind the Islam Hamas war. And uh, that being said, we'll tell you about the uh, the impact it will have on our Gilbert House tour of Israel in just a moment. Um, but uh, because we are looking at the impact of the conflict on travel to the Middle East in the spring, we uh, will now be at the, uh, the Prophetic Signs in the Heavenlies Conference in Dallas the first weekend in April. That's April 5, 6, 7. And if you want to stay to Monday, April 8th, that uh, coincides with the, the total eclipse of the sun, the second great American eclipse. Uh, you might remember the one back in uh, August of 2017. This uh, following just a different path, making a great big X that intersects near Carbondale, Illinois, if I remember right. Anyway, uh, Mike Kerr of Hear the Watchman just announced this past week during their Hear the Watchman Zoom fellowship that the registration for this uh, conference will be reduced to just $35. So just $35 to attend this conference. Speakers include Paul Begley, Colonel David Giamona, Haster Casper McLeod, David Hevner, Dr. Kerry Mayday, kind of an outspoken voice over the last few years regarding uh, medical policy here in the U.S. Dave Hodges, Michael Boldea, Tuv Rose, look forward to meeting him, John Moore, David Paxton, and Doug Thornton, who accompanied Tim Alberino on his recent expedition to Purdue, or Purdue, to Peru, not to Purdue. Uh, that would really be weird. <laughs> Went to investigate the, uh, uh, the reports coming from the jungle of the Amazon about levitating what, humans with high-tech, aliens? We, we've got a, another discussion with Timothy Alberino coming up about that here within the next couple of weeks. Uh, anyway, Doug Thornton will be there uh, as well. More information online and registration at hearthewatchmen.com, hearthewatchmen.com. Now, obviously, if we're going to be in Dallas the first weekend in April, it means we're not going to be in Israel. We've made the determination. Uh, I think the collapse of the uh, short-lived ceasefire between Israel and Hamas and the efforts by the Houthis controlling the country of Yemen, which is um, Saudi Arabia's southern neighbor, to impact shipping on the Red Sea, firing, in fact, firing this past week missiles at the USS Mason, a destroyer that came to the rescue of the Central Park, which was a, uh, a tanker, a chemical tanker uh, with links to Israel. Uh, the, the missiles didn't impact the Mason, didn't even come close, but had they, uh, things could have blown up in a real hurry into a regional war, and that's uh, that's our concern. So we are now looking at dates in early November of 2024. We will confirm specifically those dates and announce those as soon as possible. We'll send out uh, emails to all of you who have uh, registered for the con for the uh, tr tour. That is, but um, it just is not our desire to take anybody into a war zone, uh, even if it's just the perception of security. Uh, we will want to make sure that we err on the side of caution. So it looks like the, uh, the Israel tour being pushed back from April until November, following the High Holy Days, the uh, festival of the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. And uh, um, 
So again, uh, more details are coming. You'll find information always about uh, upcoming events at our uh, our app. Uh, on the app, look for the calendar app. Uh, we've got uh, there the upcoming readings for our weekly Bible study and, of course, upcoming events as far as conferences, tours, speaking events, and so forth. And you'll find the app once again at gilberthouse.org slash app. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to watch or listen wherever that may be, whether it's the uh, website vftb.net, youtube.com slash at Gilbert House, or if you're listening, whether it's through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, or Pandora now, um, thank you for taking time out to do that. Uh, Our announcer, the inimitable DC Good. And A View from the Bunker is a production of Gilbert House Ministries, released under Creative Commons Attribution on Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker. Thank you.